Welcome to the Harvard Art Museums and tonight's opening lecture for our new exhibition, Painting Edo, Japanese Art from the Feinberg Collection. My name is Nicole Nalloy, and I'm a junior living in Winthrop House. I concentrate in the history of art and architecture. My name is Oliver York. I'm a junior living in Lowell House, and I study economics. Nicole and I are members of the Harvard Art Museum Student Board, and we're delighted to welcome you here on behalf of the museum student community. Please now be sure to turn off your cell phones and help me to warmly welcome Martha Tedeschi, the Elizabeth and John Moores Cabot Director of the Harvard Art Museums, who will introduce tonight's program. Thank you, Nicole and Oliver for your warm introduction and for being members of our student board. Um, as I hope you know, we so value our student board, our student guides, and our other student workers for the infusion of energy and fresh perspectives that you bring to us every day. Uh, we value your partnership and we count on you. And now, good evening to all of you. And my heartfelt thanks to this lovely audience for filling every seat. We love that. I can't tell you how excited we are about that. And the reason is because you are here to help us mark a very important moment in the history of Harvard's art museums and in the appreciation of Japanese art at Harvard. Tonight, I'm delighted to welcome each and every one of you to the opening celebration of painting Edo, Japanese art from the Feinberg Collection, the largest exhibition we have ever undertaken at this museum. The sweeping scale of the exhibition matches the occasion as it celebrates one of the largest and most generous gifts of art ever promised to Harvard University. Over a period of nearly 50 years, Robert and Betsy Feinberg, two American kids, as Bob said to me this morning, assembled a world-class collection of more than 300 Japanese Edo period works of art, 120 of which are being shown upstairs in painting Edo. These works span all major painting schools, lineages and formats. You'll see fans, screens, hanging scrolls. And they will now offer students and scholars and every one of us a unique opportunity to take in firsthand the rich visual culture of Japanese, uh, Japan's early modern era. This transformative promise gift offers us the, expert, the extraordinary opportunity to study through original objects of the highest quality, galvanizing our vision and mission for the Harvard Art Museums. Bob and Betsy have not only been dedicated to collecting over all these years, but also to sharing these works with scholars, students, and the public for the purpose of education and enjoyment. They are generous in every sense of the word, including as collaborators in the realization of the current exhibition. It is a great disappointment that Betsy and Bob Feinberg have at the last minute been prevented from joining us. I was looking forward to making them stand up tonight. Uh, but fortunately, they're well represented by their daughter, Kara Feinberg. Kara, can you stand up? Where are you? Yeah. And as well, many family members and close friends of the Feinbergs. Bob and Betsy are certainly here in spirit. I talked to Bob this morning. And we are immensely grateful that they have established an incomparable resource at Harvard while helping us to continue a very interesting and auspicious legacy. Some of you may know that Harvard offered the very first American university courses in Asian art in 1912, which coincided with Japan's debut in the 1912 Summer Olympics, uh, the first time an Asian nation participated in the games. 
More than 100 years later, we are thrilled to host this groundbreaking exhibition during the Olympic year in Tokyo, the contemporary manifestation of Edo. A wonderful part of my job is to thank all of our wonderful supporters and collaborators who help us every day in the fulfillment of our mission. I would ask you to please bear with me for a few minutes. We take our thank yous very seriously here. Mounting a presentation like this would not have been possible without the assistance of friends old and new. In addition to the exceptional generosity of the Feinbergs themselves, this project was also made possible by the Robert Ellsworth bequest to the Harvard Art Museums, the Melvin Seden and Janine Luke Fund for publications and exhibitions, the catalogs and exhibition funds for pre-20th century art of the Fogg Museum, the Rhodes and Carpenter Foundation, and the Thierry Porte Director's Discretionary Fund for Japanese Art, and the Japan Foundation. So you can see this is, it's taken a village. The exhibition's uh, related programming is supported by the M. Victor Leventritt Lecture Series Endowment Fund, as well as Harvard University's Edwin O. Reischauer Institute of Japanese Studies, and the Department of History of Art and Architecture's Abby Aldrich Rockefeller Fund. And finally, I want to call out uh, the exhibition catalog authored by curator Rachel Saunders and Professor Yukio Lippet, which is both beautiful and revelatory. This landmark volume of richly illustrated essays is funded by the Harvard Art Museum's Mellon Publications Fund, including the Henry P. McElhaney Fund. The catalog's available in our museum shop. And did I mention the shop is open tonight? <laughs> yes, I am shameless, but that's my job. <laughs> this summer, we also look forward to the publication of a second major volume, the catalog raisonné of the entire Feinberg collection. As always, I want to express my gratitude for the encouragement and support of Harvard leadership for the work of the museums. We are fortunate to have with us tonight several of our very best and favorite cheerleaders. Lori Gross, Associate Provost for the Arts and Culture. Lori, where are you? There she is. Uh, Robin Kelsey, Dean of Arts and Humanities. Robin? Oh, wow, so modest, he's at the back. Um, and Mark Elliott, Vice Provost for International Affairs. Mark, are you here? Yay, okay, you guys are making this hard for me. <laughs> um, I also want to extend a special welcome to special guests, Mary Brinton and Gavin Whitelaw of the Reischauer Institute and Kenji Matsumoto, who is joining us from the Japan Foundation, all of whom have been generous and generative partners in this monumental endeavor. And finally, but oh so importantly, I want to extend the appreciation of all of us, especially Team Feinberg, to our superb collaborator, Professor Yukio Lippet, Director of Undergraduate Studies in the Department of Art and Architecture, and the Jeffrey T. Chambers and Andrea Okamura Professor in that department here at Harvard. Uh, Yukio received his BA in Literature from Harvard and his MA and PhD from Princeton in Art and Archaeology. He's a specialist in Japanese painting of the medie uh, medieval and early modern periods and is currently preparing a book on medieval ink painting. Kio, where are you? <laughs> Would you stand up, please? <laughs> Yukio and Rachel have been a dream team, a dynamic duo, Batman and Robin of Japanese art throughout this project. <laughs> Theirs is the kind of generous and innovative collaboration which should happen more often and for which they deserve our great admiration and congratulations. Thank you, Kio. We are forever in your debt. And now it is my pleasure to introduce curator Rachel Saunders, who will give us a brief overview of the exhibition and then introduce us to tonight's distinguished speaker, 
Tymon Screech, who comes to us from the University of London. Tymo, Tymon, welcome. Rachel is the Harvard Art Museum's Abby Aldrich Rockefeller Curator of Asian Art and is responsible for the Japanese collections here at the Harvard Art Museums. She earned her PhD from Harvard in 2015 and is a specialist in medieval narrative and sacred painting. Rachel recently curated the exhibition Prince Shotoku, The Secrets Within, which I hope many of you saw, and oversaw the presentation of Japan on paper, both in 2019, so she's been a very busy curator. She was previously a member of the Japanese Art Department of the Museum of Fine Arts here in Boston, where she worked extensively with early modern rare books and has held fellowships at the University of Tokyo and at the National Galleries Gallery of Arts Center for the Advanced Study in the Visual Arts in Washington, DC. So please help me welcome and congratulate Rachel Saunders. Good evening. It's wonderful to see you all here. So many friends, old and new. Uh, thank you, Martha, for that very generous introduction. Gives me great pleasure to be here this evening as the co-curator with Professor Yukio Lippet of the exhibition Painting Edo, Japanese Art from the Feinberg Collection. To bring an exhibition of this size to fruition takes the proverbial village. And in addition to our generous funders, whom Martha has just mentioned, I'm hugely indebted to the many individuals who have worked on painting Edo. Although I cannot mention everyone by name, I do want to leave you in no doubt <laughs> about how deeply appreciative we are of all of the incredible work that's been done in the preparation of this exhibition and its two accompanying publications over the past three years. Among these people are four to whom I owe especially deep debts of gratitude. The first is my co-curator, Professor Yukio Lippet, Jeffrey T. Chambers and Andrea Okamura, Professor of History of Art and Architecture, without whom this project would not have come into being. Professor Lippet's relationship with the Feinbergs had began more than two decades ago when, as a graduate student at Princeton, he first saw their collection on a study visit to their home. In his own words, this first visit intensified his appreciation for the merits and challenges of studying newly encountered objects to trace a cultural history, working outward in ever larger concentric circles. These concentric circles have not only been intellectual, since 2003, when Professor Lippert assumed his faculty position here, he's been taking his students to visit the Feinbergs. A decade ago, I myself was among them. In 2017, I had the privilege of co-teaching a graduate seminar on Edo painting with Professor Lippert, during which many of the ideas that lie behind this exhibition were formulated. This seminar, at which every student presented on a different painting from the collection each week, was also the form in which the catalogue raisonné, to be published later this year, began to come to life. I can't imagine a smoother or more inspirational collaboration than the one in which we have been engaged in the course of this project. I would like to thank Professor Lippert for a great many things, but in particular for his indefatigable wisdom, his eloquence, and his intellectual generosity. Thank you. The second is Ellie Glynn. Is Ellie here this evening? I think so. Maybe he's feeling a little shy. But um, Ellie Glynn is our designer for creating such an elegant installation to meet the diverse needs of the many Japanese painting formats now installed in our galleries. We began this, this project with a memorable research trip to Japan to help us to meet the challenge of sympathetically installing this collection of early modern Japanese paintings, which are native to domestic display or occasion spe specific use in temples or in tea houses, in this modern and very public building in 21st century North America. And finally, 
My deepest gratitude is, of course, to Betsy and Bob Feinberg, who have made this extraordinary promise gift of their collection the culmination of decades of sharing, both in public arenas in Japan, the US, and in Europe, but also in their home, to which they have welcomed countless scholars and students over the years. Unfortunately, as Martha mentioned, circumstances have meant that they have not been able to travel this week, and so I must thank them in absentia. But I know they are here in spirit. We are fortunate to be joined by a number of family members and close friends, and are especially delighted to welcome their daughter, Kara Feinberg. Thank you, Kara. It has been a hugely enriching experience working with Betsy and Bob, and I would like to thank them here, not only for their visionary generosity in making this gift of art, one of the most significant ever promised to this institution, but also for their apparently endless patience and manifold daily acts of kindness, from which all of us who've worked with them have benefited. The words are inadequate, but thank you, Betsy and Bob. The exhibition Painting Edo is a milestone moment in the sharing of a truly remarkable collection and is in part for this reason that the show opens with this magnificent painting by Tani Buncho titled Grasses and Moon. This enormous window-like painting commemorates a harvest moon viewing party that took place on the banks of the Sumida River on the 15th day of the eighth month, just over 200 years ago in 1817. Viewing the harvest moon amidst convivial gatherings of friends is a venerable East Asian tradition marked by merrymaking and versification and associated with fellowship for the idea that no matter how far we may be separated from those dear to us, distance alone cannot prevent us all viewing the same moon in the same sky on that same evening. And to me, this feels particularly poignant today. The radical proximity of the river reeds conveys a powerful sense of theirness. Yet the inked image, the archaizing seal, and the poetic inscription weave this one specific occasion into a communal historical fabric of every other preceding moon viewing party. So that not just the 1817 gathering, but also our unique experience of this painting, here and now, also converges as a shared memory that echoes throughout centuries of human experience. Painting Edo offers a window onto the supremely rich visual culture of Japan's seminal early modern era. But for me, just as importantly, what it seeks to offer is simply the opportunity to experience seeing differently. The sheer range and quality of works allows for art historical exploration, not only of what was deemed aesthetically significant enough to be considered beautiful in a time and place very different from our own moment, but also for investigations of contemporary notions of strangeness and eccentricity, or of the geoesthetics of sacred mountains and seascapes, of the potential of parody and visual trickery, and of the valorization of the rendering of subjective experience of a place or plant over lugubrious optical verisimilitude. And following that, an idealized relationship to the world in which mossy pebbles can be expanded into towering extraterrestrial mountains or whole animated mountainscapes captured in microcosmically small ink paintings. Japanese paintings are produced from a distinctive alchemy of silk, soot, gold, fire, and fur, with a history stretching back more than 1,200 years. They also have a significant and more recent history as cultural contact zones between Japan and the West, since the opening of the Japanese archipelago to European visitors in the late 16th century, the movement of images between East and West has been both demanding and facilitating a consciousness of the need to move beyond habituated frames of visual and intellectual reference. This has resulted in some spectacular creative disruptions in the history of art in both Japan and in the West. One could point to Impressionism and Art Nouveau, for example as well as unknown numbers of personal transforma transformational encounters. 
It seems fitting that as we here in Cambridge, Massachusetts undertake an extended close look at Japanese art in this exhibition, it is through a collection whose beginnings were sparked when two young Americans in New York were stopped in their tracks by none other than a 17th century Japanese vision of the first Westerners to arrive in Japan in 1543. Namely, the Portuguese sailors and missionaries distinguished here by their extreme height what the Japanese very politely called high noses, and their flamboyant silk trousers. Now, Edo is, of course, both the time, usually designated as 1615 to 1868, and a place. The historical city of Edo, known to us today as Tokyo. Already by 1800, it was the largest city in the world, dwarfing contemporary London or Paris, with more than a million inhabitants. Although the ancient city, uh, the ancient imperial city of Kyoto in central Japan remained the official capital, Eastern Edo was the seat of the new de facto rulers, the Tokugawa shoguns, who began the process of unifying the archipelago's more than 260 domains under their military regime. Japan's early modern era brought an immense appetite for intellectual and pictorial culture and a dizzying array of painting schools and lineages was established to meet the demands of traditional aristocratic patrons, as well as the newly affluent. Many of their visually alluring works share an interesting convergence, where the classical tangles with the contemporary, high meets low, and domestic plays against international. In the post-war era, scholars have attempted to deal with the pictorial wealth of Edo painting by taxonomizing, evolving a comfortable model for dealing with this abundance through labels such as floating world to denote polychrome images of the demimonde, or literati for cinephile ink paintings. Rimpa is the term often used for the elegantly designed images of the followers of Ogata Korin, and Maruyama Shijo for the gauzy, veris, gauzy visual verisimilitude of the many followers of the most successful painter of the 18th century, Maruyama Okyo, and eccentric for those who refused both the constraints and benefits of membership of any particular school or lineage and instead struck it out alone. But over time, this model has been offering gradually diminishing returns as these triangulation points have been understood as representative of the figurative terrain itself, masking some of its actual features with a comfortable veil of over-familiarity. The breadth, depth, and quality of the Feinberg collection has made it possible for us to begin a re-examination of the categories of Edo painting and to present it instead as far as possible on its own terms. To do so, we have returned to the more malleable Edo period conceptions of painterly lineage, or ryuha in Japanese, since it was through membership of such lineage organizations, which mirrored the pervasive semi-feudal organization of the warrior household, that Edo period artists understood their own subjectivity. It is primarily to our understanding of such lineages to which we have looked in the organizing rubric of the 10 chapters of this exhibition. The physical layout is designed to welcome and orient the newcomer to Edo art among a representative selection of paintings in, initial, in, initial, in an initial lineage gallery. But beyond this, there is no prescriptive route. Instead, it is our hope that visitors will feel free to wonder and immerse themselves in the paintings that both reflected and constructed Edo for their contemporary viewers, and which continue to influence, alter, and enhance our vision today. Now, to help us get started on this journey, we are extremely fortunate tonight to have with us our guest speaker, Professor Timon Screech of the School of Oriental and African Studies, or SOAS, the University of London, who has in fact flown in from Tokyo, where he is currently visiting research professor at the Tokyo University of Foreign Studies uh, to be with us here tonight. I am particularly delighted to be welcoming him back to campus for what I hope will feel like something of a homecoming, for it was here that he earned his doctorate. But also because it was with Professor Screech that I myself began my first encounter with Edo art, perhaps a bit longer ago than either of us cares to recall tonight. <laughs> Now, Professor Timon Screech uh, received his BA in Japanese from Oxford University and his PhD in art history from Harvard. 
I have heard it said he had initially intended to study Buddhist sculpture or perhaps medieval ink painting, but that a twist of fate instead led him to make his groundbreaking doctoral study of the nature of vision in Edo, Japan, especially as mediated by new devices such as telescopes and microscopes, symptomatic, symptomatic of the so-called Western scientific gaze. After completing his doctorate, he took up his position at the University of London, where he has now been teaching in inimitable style for three decades, stimulating the thoughts and influencing the careers of hundreds of students in that time. In 2006, he was elected to a chair in the history of art, and in 2012, became head of the School of Arts at SOAS. In 2018, he was elected as a fellow of the British Academy. It's impossible to describe uh, the wide reach of Professor Screech's prolific research in the field of Edo art in a short introduction like this. His work has broken new ground in numerous, numerous directions. From the revolutionary effects of polished glass on early modern vision into Japan, to revealing Edo's occidentalism and exposing the myth of J Japan's infamous isolation from the rest of the world through his studies of Edo transculturalism. He has also recentered the production and consumption of ludic and popular arts and their, shall we say, extra visual dimensions. His teaching career has taken him all over the globe. He has served as visiting professor of art history at the University of Chicago and at both Gakushuin University and Waseda University in Tokyo. Professor Screech is the author of innumerable articles and more than 10 books published in multiple languages. Of these, I might mention The Shogun's Painted Culture, Fear and Creativity in the Japanese States from 1997, Sex and the Floating World, Erotic Imagery in Japan, 1999, The Lens Within the Heart, The, Sen the Western Scientific Gaze and Popular Imagery in Edo, Japan, 2002, which is one of my personal favorites, and Obtaining Images, Art, Production, and Display in Edo, Japan in 2012, which has been described as a sophisticated primer for nearly all of Professor Screech's intellectual concerns over the past 20 years. We are eagerly anticipating the publication of this, this year of not one, but two volumes, Tokyo Before Tokyo, Power and Magic in the Shogun City of Edo, and The Shogun's Silver Telescope, God, art and money in the English quest for Japan, to which I, for one, am very much looking forward. Please join me in offering a very warm welcome to our speaker tonight, Professor Timon Screech. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <You're good. laughs> well, thank you. Um, Thank you very much for selecting me amongst the many um, amazing scholars of Edo art to be the one to tell the world that the Feinberg collection is absolutely sensational and to welcome you all. It's not my role to do it, but I hope you all go and view it many, many times. Sadly, I go back to Tokyo on Sunday, but I hope to have a few trips to see it before that. And I had the pleasure of seeing the Feinberg collection in, in the Feinberg's house in Bethesda about 20 years ago. And uh, it really inspired me very much indeed, so that was wonderful. It's also great to be back in Hanford, and as Japanese monks and nuns say when referring to their early life um, in the secular world, that was in the days when I still had hair. <laughs> um, so, the Feinberg collection is so enormously um, kaleidoscopic, there's so much to see in it, I couldn't begin to do justice to it in the um, number, number of minutes I've got available to speak today. So what I thought I'd do is to take one moment, because actually although the Edo period is long, depending on how you define it, 250 years or so, um, the moments of artistic creativity came in surges. Of course, 250 years could not have been one continuous moment. And we see this in the Feinberg collection where uh, large numbers of objects come from the latter part of the 18th century. So I won't really go into like why that might be, that's an interesting question to think about, um, but let me just take it as a fact, tolerate it for the next 40 minutes if you will, that the late 18th century was a period of special interest in artistic production. 
And uh, although I said I won't go into it, I might say it was a period of inter interest in artistic production because it was in a period of interest in the outside world too. And not only um, good things happening, but a lot of bad things happening. So I'd like to set the works which you can look at and they speak for themselves in a historical context, which not all of you may have access to otherwise, but which I think colors and informs everything that you can uh, look at um, upstairs. So to begin, you may have had a sneak preview of the first slide, it came up a little bit too early there. But since uh, we're just down the road from, from Boston, the end of the 18th century makes you think of um, George III. <laughs> and this is the fine portrait of him. Of course, it's how he wanted to be seen. It's not how he was seen by everyone, but just to uh, think of that, because the late 18th century in Japan was uh, under the rule of a person that bears some similarity to George III, uh, the shogun Tokugawa Ieharu. And Ieharu was the 10th incumbent of what would be 15 generations of Tokugawa shogun. Of course, they didn't know each other. They probably didn't even know of each other, but there's some, uh, some parallels. Well, perhaps you know the rhyme. We often say it in, in England, George III ought never to have occurred. <laughs> One can only wonder at so grotesque a blunder. <laughs> and this was a verse by Edmund Clary Hugh Bentley, whose name gave rise to the verse Clary Hughes, when you say rude things about important people in an AABB rhyme. <laughs> so I determined to uh, do the same for you with one on Ie Haru. Ie Haru his mind so narrow, one can only wonder at so grotesque a blunder. <laughs> um, the shogun wasn't really much, uh, but many of the shoguns weren't. And although we often call them generalissimos, generals, all kinds of words, warriors, most shoguns um, stayed in bed too late, stayed in the women's quarters too long, uh, and drank too much, and in Iharu's case, um, ate sweets all the time. He went so far as to build a brothel inside Edo Castle because he wanted to know what it was like to have to pay for it. Um, this talk is not about him because there would not be a whole lot to say, but fortunately, shoguns by this point had become fairly uh, ritualized uh, figures, and they always had a chief minister that did the ruling for them. And the chief ministers, naturally, were selected not by um, Buggins's turn, the next son in line, but somebody who was competent and responsible, serious, intelligent, uh, and adult in their behavior. And Tanuma Okitsugu was the um, head of the shogunal council under Ieharu. So his role, really, and his personality imprints itself on the period much more than um, the shogun himself did. This portrait is um, it's the only one I know, there may be others, and it's by an artist who's not particularly um, well known, but it shows, uh, shows Okitsugu there, dressed formally in the guise of a very senior bureaucrat with a court hat on, his traditional robes, which are tied at the sleeve, not sewn together, but he looks attentively. You could imagine he's in, the case, he's in the process of meditating some government policy, considering how the effects of, say, taxation or new legislation will have on the common people. Will it be beneficial or will it not? He looks intently. Behind him, above his right shoulder, is a beautifully red lacquered desk with a tome on it, which we are to, ima to imagine is a book of perhaps history or statescraft. This is how he wished to see himself. And although that artist is not famous, one who is very famous, I'm sorry, the slide's not too good, Kano Eisen Michinobu, was extensively used by Tanuma Okitsugu to promote himself and his visions of government. Uh, Michinobu was from the great, distinguished, long-standing Kano school, who had already been painting for people in power, especially military figures in power, for many generations. And here we see Michinobu painting that same leader of the government, Tanuma Okisugu, viewing his domains. East Asian art, of course, is viewed from right to left, so we begin looking at this very long horizontal work. It's not a scroll, it's a single work, but it's long by Japanese standards. You begin with a village on the right. It's a peasant village, it's not rich. Peasants have to work and they shouldn't be rich. But at the same time, they shouldn't be enslaved, they shouldn't starve, they shouldn't be beaten. This is a charming little country village under trees. 
uh, and Tanuma Okitsugu there stands with his back to us on raised ground, looking down over his countryside, over his peasants, knowing that the land is well regulated. Behind, and again, he's wearing court costume, a much more formal kind again now. This would um, uh, indicate him as a senior minister who's now gone out into the countryside in so-called hunting dress. Behind him are two servants carrying his ritual implements. And then finally is a large pine tree. The pine tree symbolizes good government. Japanese language has very few sounds in it, about a third as many sounds as there are in English, which means you make puns all the time when you're speaking Japanese, sometimes accidentally, sometimes deliberately, and the word for pine tree is the same as the word for correct and the word for government. So the pine tree stands always there for good government. Pine trees are long living and they're evergreen. They don't change according to the seasons as government should be long lasting and fixed. So Michinobu was a kind of um, iconographer for Tanuma Okitsugu's rule. As well as rather inventive one-off pictures like this, he did the standard sorts of um, auspicious themes. Uh, this is really rather generic here. We already saw in Rachel's um, overview of the collection the same theme. Cranes, cranes live for a thousand years, they said, and they are lords of the air. And terrapins, that's freshwater turtles, uh, live for 10,000 years, and they are lords of the waters. And so a diptych showing such things shows a world that is bountiful uh, and ongoing in its bounty, uninterrupted. Trip diptychs are not that common in Japanese art, more common are triptychs, and I imagine this was made to hang either side of a central image, which it would be up to the owner to select. It wasn't made to be three. The owner had already an image that they wanted, a pair to hang either side. It could even be a portrait of Tanuma Okitsugu himself thanks to whose government this bounty of the seasons goes on and on and on. Such was the way he saw himself. But in your country and in my country, we know very well, and in Japan I might say, that senior politicians don't always see themselves in the way that they're perceived by the people under their charge. <laughs> Tanuma Okitsugu had a beautiful huge palace in the center of Edo, modern day Tokyo, and those who went to visit him there were struck by the fact it had a glass ceiling. The glass ceiling has a symbolic meaning for us today, I think, uh, but them also has a symbolic meaning. People sat inside, looked at the ceiling, and swimming above them were fish. You actually had an aquarium above your head. Quite sensational to do it. And I think Tanama Okitsugu wanted you to think that you were in the Dragon King's palace. Right. Under the sea is the Dragon King's palace. The Dragon King is a person of perfect um, regulation. His kingdom is perfect. But other people not wishing to see that imagery saw rather the world inverted. We should look down in fish at fish from above, from bridges or from stepping stones or standing in water. We shouldn't look up at them. And inadvertently, perhaps, Tanam Ogitsugu had created an image of incorrect rule, the wrong way up. Important figures to, to see him to um, discuss business or government matters, whatever it might be, um, were, were furious to discover that their inferiors, if bearing bigger gifts and bribes, were admitted ahead of them. Tanama Okitsugu today has the reputation for somebody who did not rule well because he ruled only with consideration for finances and principally his own rather than those of the state. Their view of government was such that if government was ill, it didn't only mean that people suffered, but the whole world started to go wrong. And particularly numbers. <clears throat> we number our years from 1 to uh, 2020. But in East Asia, in China, they n numbered their, their years according to the emperor's reign, first year of the reign, etc. But in Japan, they numbered the years according to some auspicious um, a term. So, for example, uh, something happened, uh, the scholars declare, we'll begin again with year one, they invent a nice uh, expression for it, and an era would continue for a dozen years or so. And it so happened that in the year 1764, a new era was declared. They called it the first year of Mewa, 
And this year, by the way, in Japan, there's a second year of reiwa, right? It's the same wa. Wa means both, it's a pun again, it means both Japan and harmony. And mei means radiance. So the year of radiant harmony was declared. It's wonderful, right? The thing, the world is going very well. And so the first year, mei wa one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, worked very nicely, 771. And then when you got to mei wa seven, no, mei wa eight, someone suddenly said, oh my God, we've made a terrible mistake. Because what happens in Mei Wa 9? Mei Wa 9, again with Japanese puns, Mei Wa Kunen means either ninth year of Mei Wa or the Mei year of tribulations. The scholars had done their job so absurdly, in, uh, um, carelessly, they'd actually created an era that was going to invoke and bring upon itself catastrophe. And indeed that happened. The ninth year of Meiwa is associated with famines, uh, with peasant uprisings, and with all kinds of baleful events. And so the government immediately changed the name of the era. And so halfway through 1772 comes a new era called Temmei, which means um, Mei is the same Mei, brightness, and Ten is the heavens. And the period of Tenmei, which accounts for a vast output of Japanese art, and not all works in the Feinberg collection are datable, but I would imagine that no other decade has as much output as the 1780s. The Tenmei period then was hoped to be a time when they'd rectified a, a, a problem and things were getting better again, but it wasn't to be that way. The Tenmei era stands for famine, peasant uprisings, uh, distress across the entire nation. It ends, and I'll come back to it in a second, in the year 1789, which you remember from your European history is a rather important year, the French Revolution. In fact, all across the world, there were revolutions in 1789. It was an El Nino year, and uh, people starved all across the world. I'll come back to that in a second. But the decade of Temmei under um, Shogun Ieharu and the great minister Tanama Okitsugu was not a happy one for the peasants nor for their rulers. <clears throat> and yet, art did extremely well during this time. Much of the art, however, was not the official sort of thing the Kanor school was doing, but it's a kind of escapist um, art that refuses to engage with the way the world is because the way the world is is not pleasant but you can't change it. Rachel has already referred to literati painting which can also be called southern painting. It means the same thing. Southern painting uh, is uh, a modern term really but something that they thought about. The south, uh, it's a Chinese concept. Uh, Beijing means the northern capital, right? Like France, uh, um, China was ruled from the north. So if you go to the south, it means you're going away from centers of power, you're going deliberately to where government uh, is rather thin on the ground and you can get away with things. You're not policed so much. It's not so different really from leaving Paris and going to Avignon or Arles. Uh, the weather's nicer, the food's better, the people are less rude, right? And there are fewer government officials around. So Southern painting had that sense that it came from China and therefore it was painted in a way that the painter made it clear and the patron commissioning it made it clear. They're not talking about this world. They're talking about some other kind of space, a better place than our world. They called it China, but when they talked about China in the Edo period, they didn't usually mean that country across the sea that they may or may not admire. They meant China as an ancient cultural space. It's like when George III or uh, 18th century Europeans talked about Greece and Rome. They didn't mean those places you could actually go to that they probably thought were rather inferior to their own cultures. They meant a wonderful ancient time. And so Japanese artists in this world began producing southern style painting, referring to, you've just seen half of this screen pair uh, already, now we have the second half of it on the, on the, on the, on the, on below on the left, escapist world. I've put a little asterisks next to images which I'm showing you from the Feinberg collection. Suchet was a great poet, but he distanced himself from the state 
and he went to live in a, a kind of rural area where he produced splendid poems. He could just do it. He didn't have to train. He didn't have to study with anyone. When somebody asked him how he wrote such amazing verse, he said, it's like drinking. If you drink enough, you'll throw up. You don't know how you did it, but you just produced something. It's very, <laughs> it's very Freudian. And if you, if you do look at enough art, it's not the same thing will happen. But of course, this is consciously not formal art. The other figure uh, in the pairing, uh, Meng Jia, <clears throat> he uh, was a, such a wonderful poet. He was summoned to court. In these old days, the emperor valued poetry, which they say didn't happen in the modern world. And when he was at court, a gust of wind blew his hat off. He appeared to, in, before the emperor without a hat on, which was a breach of protocol. But his poetry was so absorbing, neither he nor the emperor even noticed. Such, they're saying, was how the world used to be, but it's not like that for us anymore. Figures uh, from the past then could be invoked in this deliberately southern style, non-contemporary, spontaneous manner. They could be figures, they could be generalized landscapes. Naka Bayashi Chikuto did similar things. Here we see a single screen with a landscape. It isn't anywhere. It's a wonderful world. They called them landscapes within your chest, sometimes translated as landscapes of the mind or landscapes of the heart, but actually the word is very physical, actually inside your rib cage. The world out there is not pleasant anymore, but the world in your mind, the world in your heart, the world which you personally are trying to embody is still beautiful. So it's not peasants in a landscape, it's beautiful, rustic mansions of a great person who has left the world behind because the world is not good. And a third case, Kibaite. No long, no, neither a <clears throat> figure from the, from the classical past nor an imaginary landscape, but here a poetic gathering. They used to actually have these things. Learned people would get together and not talk about government because the government wouldn't listen to them. In the old days, perhaps it would have done, it doesn't anymore. So they immersed themselves in historical thought. And this very famous story of the um, Orchid Pavilion is when an um, ancient uh, worthy figure neglected by the rulers who are not concerned with him, um, floated cups of sake down a stream and figures came to drink the sake as it floated past them. And they would be uh, uh, so kind of thrilled by this experience, they would come out with poems. The poems were oppositional. They were poems that said, why does the world have to be the way it is today? It's interesting that alcohol was part of the way this world worked. You didn't go to see Tanama Okitsugu or the Shogun half drunk. But if you, and I didn't come today, right? I was very tempted to have one for coming, right? <clears throat> there are moments when it's appropriate to be sober and serious, and there are moments when it's appropriate to think in the alternative way that alcohol provides for your mind. Of course, you don't, um, you don't fawn on people. You don't flatter when you're drunk. Drunkards speak truth. They say, what is that thing inside their chests? And so al uh, alcohol is often said to be, and often artists write up on the side, I did this when I was drunk. They maybe they did, maybe they didn't, but they're saying, I've diverged from the way serious world is today because I can't stand the world I'm in. Well, the numbers of people that wanted to immerse themselves in an idealized classical past, of course, couldn't be that great. Another form of escapism that we find takes a totally different form. And this is what they called the floating world or the floating worlds, the ukiyo. The ukiyo was not for refined, elegant people who thought that they should have a role in government, but, but were denied it. It was for the townspeople. Many common people uh, in the towns, townspeople of course can be elite people too, but they're not wanderers of the, of the countryside. The townspeople, by virtue of their social uh, class, were not able to engage in politics at all. They might be highly educated, they might be highly motivated, they might be very successful business people, they might even be rich, 
but they couldn't move up to the next level in the social structures of the time. So they floated. They floated. And the floating world was a place of distractions, of dissipation of energies, or of spaces in which, again, you could create a world as you wanted the world to be, not as the world as it really was. The Nanga people imagined a great world of the Chinese past. The floating world people imagined a great world of the present. In this modern world of the present, everyone is beautiful, and above all, everyone is happy and fulfilled. That's a great myth to have. So here we have a case, a young woman, uh, you can tell she's unmarried because she's got uh, long sleeves, dangling sleeves. She's gone out to harvest bamboo. That means to say it's New Year, the bamboo is coming up, it's a luxury foodstuff. She's off to harvest some. She's not a peasant girl. Peasant girls don't dress like this, right? She's a good girl from a good home who's enjoying the bounty of nature. That's one side of the floating world. Beautiful young people exploring themselves, exploring their society, falling in love, having a nice time. The second side of the floating world at the time, they said, it's like a coin that has two sides. The other side of it was the theater district. Not sure if the Feinberg collection includes any image of this kind. Many theater works are ephemeral. A show was on, it went off, so they're more often prints than paintings. And today we've often lost the subject matter of the place. We don't have scripts. We only have the images. But again, a young woman with long sleeves and a boy with the shaved top of his head. You can see a little white bit at the top of his head. This means they're both underage. They are not yet married and they're falling in love. Isn't that lovely? Right. And they're falling in love on their own. That means that their parents have not told them who to marry. Right. The ultimate fantasy of the blessed felicitous state for a commoner person who can't expect to be called in by the government was simply to marry someone that they liked. Right. Not possible for most people, therefore you fantasize it. In the floating world, you go and see it on the stage. And Kabuki um, audiences were overwhelmingly made up of young women in domestic service for whom the fantasy of a boy like this, and he's even got two swords, so he's a samurai boy, uh, to, will, to, to marry them, take them off, and to respect them. The floating world and the southern world are therefore uh, uh, alternative spaces to a world which you can't happily populate. But going back to Tanuma Okitsugu, he there in Edo is running the government, surrounding himself with Kano Eisen Michinobu's portraits of how good the world is, not how much you need to flee from it. Not loved by all people, but he thought everyone loved him. And until the year 1784, midway through that Tenmei period, when his son was assassinated. His son was assassinated in Edo, Edo Castle itself. It was the first time anyone had drawn their sword in Edo Castle for three generations. The previous time someone had drawn their sword, he had had to commit suicide the very next day with all his samurai retainers thrown out and uh, deprived of their incomes. A very famous moment in Japanese um, judicial history. Again, a sword was drawn in anger in Edo Castle. And interestingly enough, no one dared talk about what happened. This happens in the Edo period that matters of horrendous government embarrassment are hidden. But what should happen? But there was a Dutchman around at the time who gathered rumors on the street and wrote them down. And this is what he said people were secretly saying. Right? The three extraordinary councils of, council of state, the top three people, left the palace at the same time as Tanama Okitomo, that's the son, Okitomo. But they walked very quickly and they left him at some distance behind. Sano Zenzaemon, who was on duty in the Hall of Lotuses, seized the opportunity and running up, gave him a violent cut with his saber on the arm. The guards on duty with Zenzaemon and those from the central hall and the Hall of Chrysanthemums 
came up on hearing the noise, but so leisurely that there is every reason to believe it to have been their intention to give the assassin time to escape. The body of Okitomo was privately interred that night. The hatred and indignation of the people was so violent that they threw stones from all sides at the coffin and those who accompany it. Sanon, on the contrary, became an object of public veneration. Well, these high-level things happening in the shogun's city of Edo. But Japan had two important cities. The other was the city of Kyoto. Although it's worth pointing out that although today Kyoto is the official name of the city, Kyoto is not actually a place name. Kyoto simply means the capital. And many Chinese people today don't say Beijing as we do. They call it Kyoto in the pronunciation of Chinese, uh, the capital. So the capital wasn't actually a city called the capital, Washington, London, Paris. It was the disembodied, miraculous capital that had been there for hundreds and hundreds of years. No matter what petty interim politics went on in Edo, Kyoto was always there. And the great artist of that period and very well represented in the Feinberg collection was Maruyama Okyo person of great interest in his own right. I don't have time to go into much detail about it today, but this is on the poster. Uh, you've already seen a detail of this peacock. The peacock is not particularly symbolic of good government. It's not like the crane or the, or, or the, or the terrapin or the pine or the bamboo. It just is an incredibly beautiful thing from nature. And Orkyo is showing that, along with a peony, a huge, effulgent, enormous, glorious, gorgeous plant. And that's what Kyoto was thought to be. No grubbiness here, no politicking, no accepting bribes. The court was there. And Maruyama Okyo was the great um, painter of this kind of work. He painted very broadly, not only for the elite. The emperor had Okyo's paintings in his collection, so did wealthy commoners. The peasants had even heard his name and they reported that his brush was actually able to sing. Orkyo was one of the first artists who painted across class at this time. The bounty of nature, as if he's saying, should be the same for all people, peasants, uh, merchants and rulers. Such was the capital until the end of the Tenmei period when it disappeared. Those of you who've been to Kyoto, probably many of you have, are likely have been told Kyoto is the eternal capital of Japan. But actually, there are only six buildings in Kyoto that predate the Great Fire of 1788. There are about as many buildings, old buildings in Harvard Square. <laughs> of course, modern day Kyoto has expanded, so many buildings which were in the countryside outside Kyoto at that time are now considered part of Kyoto municipality, so there are more old buildings. But in the central section, very, very little. And this was a map produced at the time to stay that terrible fire of the Tenmei period, 1788. The little black block on the right, which is not burnt down, was the Shogunal Castle, which had a moat and therefore was able to be able to survive. And if we put their map on top of um, our modern map, you can see how Kyoto, as it looks today, the entire middle section had been wiped out. How could such a thing happen? And they asked themselves precisely that question. One of the emperor's senior courtiers wrote, what can the gods mean by this? It can't just be a fire. Something must have happened. Remember, remember, and think how it can be that the passing of the generations have brought us to this point. The emperor of the Enryaku era, in the 8th century, who created Kyoto. He moved the capital of this place, with the mountains for its hems and the river for its girdle, erecting stout palace pillars, surely blessing enough for 100 million years. He laid out the city to conform with the germantic diagram of the four beasts, to be a changeless abode, abode, sorry, abode for his household. How deprived times have come when a fire can break out, even here. Never mind then the pathetic, money-grubbing behavior of the Edo shogun elite, 
What should have been the changeless, superior world of Kyoto had also struck up against time as well. So what do you do in such conditions? Maruyama Okyo had one solution. This painting is not dated, so I can't prove to you that it made a response to the fire. But he made a screen, this is a half screen, the right hand side I'm not showing you. Um, puppies under bamboo. What does that mean? The word for dog, it doesn't have to be puppy, but the word for dog is written like this. And the word for bamboo is written like that. And if you put bamboo above dog, you have this one, which means laughter. What else can you do when the world has fallen apart? This Okyo painting is not from the Feinberg collection, but there is a wonderful painting on the same theme by Okyo's student, Rosetsu, which you can see upstairs. Fooling around, forgetting it, laughing your way through chaos. Okyo's studio burnt down. He lost all his archive of models for painting. He had to flee to the country. Also burnt down was the emperor's palace. The emperor put his feet on the ground for the first time in his life as emperor. The emperor never sets foot on the ground. He's carried everywhere. Such was the panic, he ran to his ox cart and was whisked out of the palace. The people were in such panic, they were milling around in the streets. His outriders withdrew their swords and 2,000 people were cut down to make way for the emperor to escape to safety out. When he got to safety, he commissioned a painting, which he gave to one of those six surviving buildings that had not been burnt down, which was the, main, the only surviving temple hall. He gave them a painting. I'm sorry, I could only get this version of it with a... I took it from a catalogue, so it's got writing over the top of it. By the Cannell School, the official painter in Edo, Guo Ziyi and his great-grandchildren. The Shokokuji Temple was the only standing Buddha Hall after the fire, and they were given this. Well, Guo Ziyi was a Chinese general, military figure, who lived to see his great-grandchildren. Of course, not many people would ever live so long to see their great-grandchildren, and his grandchildren were very, very numerous. So he stands for power and authority and its perpetuation, just about to be erased. And the emperor could not go back into the city to return this, so he had his uncle, who was a senior abbot, deliver it. The crown, the prince abbot, who was abbot of the shogun's temple up there um, outside Edo. Uh, no such painting on this theme in the Feinberg collection, but there's a great example on the same theme in the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston by another, um, it's a much smaller painting, by another master of the Cannell School. So, things are not going so well. Kano Eisen Michinobu continues to paint auspicious themes as if that will make any difference. And then he died. <laughs> when he died, this great painter who's painted for power and authority for a few generations, when Eisen was alive, even a quickly painted triptych on silk sold for 10 ryo. 10 ryo is an enormous sum of money. And an ink painting on a folding fan, very casual piece, even that sold for one bu. After Eisen died, however, no one liked his work. Today you can see it in antique shops, priced extremely low, but still no one buys it. Paintings and calligraphy usually rise in value after an artist's death, but in the case of Eisen's paintings, the opposite holds true. The reason for this is that he constantly attended Lord Tanuma. He associated with him day and night and never left his side. Government depiction had been contaminated by association with the bad rulers of the age. Well, this is all stories about things happening within Japan. But as we've seen in Rachel's introduction, Japan was by no means in a state of isolation and there were foreigners going back and forth across the country. The Portuguese and the Spanish who had come to Japan, um, they say they'd come to Japan to preach the word of God. We say they'd come to Japan to extract its silver. 
At any rate, they were there in large numbers, but they were expelled from Japan, leaving the Dutch East India Company to trade with Japan over the entire Edo period. They took into Japan things that Japan needed, principally uh, Indian cotton, Chinese silk, and uh, Malaysian sugar. And they took out from Japan, the Jesuits had already taken away all the silver. So they took away Japanese copper, which is also very high level, and gifts. And this rather choreographed trade with the Dutch went on for quite a long time. Samuel Pepys, um, maybe you know him, his diary. There he is wearing a Japanese kimono, right? Elite people, and Pepys even writes in his diary about he borrowed a kimono to have his portrait painted in it. Imagine there's a kimono rental service in London in 1666. Uh, so that the elites in Europe acquired Japanese things. Marie Antoinette had lots of lacquer. The elite in Japan also acquired Western things. It's not difficult. But then the Dutch East India Company, at exactly the moment we're talking about, 1780s, 1790s, was forced into bankruptcy. This is the period of the beginning of the Napoleonic Wars. Holland itself disappeared as a country. The only place on earth where the Dutch flag still flew was in their trading station in Nagasaki. The Dutch stadtholder, the head of the Dutch government, fled to London and he put all his possessions under the, gov under the control of the British crown. Therefore the British think they have the right now to sail into Nagasaki and to trade. And so a young, rather hot-headed person called Commodore Fleetwood Pellew in the Phaeton sailed into Nagasaki and told the Japanese, the Dutch trading station is ours now. We will trade with you. And they offered to sell knives and forks and tin trays made in Manchester as a better solution than Chinese silk and Indian cotton. The governor of Nagasaki was so shocked by this, he took his own life. The first time, the only time, uh, someone holding that office had ever um, been shamed. Uh, but Commodore Pellew, at any rate, um, uh, left word that the English were now in control, took one of the Dutch senior officers back, to, uh, back with him to the English um, trading station in Java and negotiated for the transfer of the East India, Dutch East India Company assets to England. They then sent a Royal Navy ship around the Japanese coast to map it. Japanese peasants for generations had been told, if you see a foreign ship in, in the waters off your villages, unless you're off Nagasaki, which was an open port, report it immediately. Runners were coming in to Edo from all over the country saying, a ship has been spotted. And then two days later, further along, another runner comes in. They knew that they were being assessed, evaluated from outside. This had never happened in the period of the Dutch. Even the Portuguese and Spanish had come into Japan to, um, to, to extract its silver and to convert people. But they'd never thought of conquering Japan. That was beyond the aspirations even of the King of Spain at the time. The British, it now seemed, were about to try and do it. Since Tanama Okitsugu's son had been assassinated. There was an interregnum, and there was no senior councillor of state for a period of years. But just as this happens, Matsudara Sadanobu is brought in to assume that office. Matsudara Sadanobu, in this wonderful self-portrait, is wearing the similar costume that we saw Tanama Okitsugu wearing in the first portrait I showed you. But interestingly enough, this one is a self-portrait. There are many self-portraits in Japanese history, or rather there are many, scare quotes, self-portraits in Japanese history, because a person of high-level probity, honorific status, seriousness of mind, could not be looked at. You didn't have an artist come in and stare at you. You therefore painted your own face in a mirror and gave an artist it to polish it up and do your body or that's what you said you did. It made the world believe that you had observed the correct protocols. There's an interesting case when the emperor's portrait was painted. Of course, nobody could go in and look at him. 
So an artist sat in the opposite room, and the emperor's uncle, who was a monk, who therefore could meet, monks can meet anyone, uh, ran back and forth between the artist and the emperor, saying, do this bit, this bit, change that here. <laughs> so Sadonobu, at any rate, by having this portrait made and telling the world it's a portrait, a self-portrait, he's saying his, his regime is going to be rather different from the one before. Anyone could meet Tanama Okitsugu if they came in with a big enough bribe. Rules are back. Japan is going to look after itself properly again. And he took as his chief painter to help him in his vision of government, not a Senin Michinobu, who's still alive for a couple of years. He doesn't use him at all. He selects an artist called Tani Buncho. And Rachel began with the wonderful painting, uh, which was behind Mr. and Mrs. Feinberg in the photograph we saw uh, of the moonlit night. But Tani Buncho is also well known for highly realistic landscapes. And Sadonobu had him do portraits, not portraits, landscape views of the Japanese coastline. Now, Japanese art has a lot of landscape paintings, of course, as does Chinese and Korean painting. But on the whole, Japanese landscapes are confined to what they call poetic sites. If a poet had written about a place, that legitimated it as a painting subject. You didn't just go and paint somewhere because it was nice. Right? So, but Buncho did. He went around the Edo Bay, and as it says by the title, um, there's a whole series of pictures, by appointment, Sadanobu had asked him to go and paint these landscapes. He is investigating the periphery of Japan, which they'd long thought, this is the English think the same thing, by being on an island, they're safe. And then suddenly he realized the sea is not just a wall, it's also an open road. And that's exactly what Sadanobu said. And so these sea views were to be admired to think about the isolation or not isolation of Japan. But Sadanobu had another intention with these. When these were brought back to Edo Castle, he looked at them all and he thought the best place is to install gunneries to bombard any foreign ship that might come close. That never actually happened, but we see art being used for quite a different purpose than Michinobu had used it for um, Tanema Okitsugu. Well, I'm coming to the order the end of my time, and so I'm coming to the end of the things I want to say to you, but Buncho, working for Matsurada Sadonobu, had one other very big project. Mapping the coastline in, in paintings in order to be able to defend it against foreign shipping was one thing that they did. But Sadonobu also was interested in this thing within the Japanese peripheries, the Japanese islands. Today, we would simply call this Japanese culture. But nobody ever used the word Japanese culture. It's not a concept that people had at the time. In fact, I would go so far as to say that Matsunai Rao Sadonobu invented the whole notion of a Japanese culture. And he did this by sending Buncho and a whole team of artists around Japan to collect drawings, sketches, uh, paintings of the greatest monuments in the Japanese heritage. Uh, previous rulers, people in power, had sent people around to find important works of art and to take them. Right? But Buncho takes nothing. He leaves everything in place as it should be. He just makes a copy. And he took that back to Sadonobu. And the piles and piles of paper were accumulating in Sadonobu's mansion, where all the most famous things of Japanese art whether they were paintings, sculptures, things that today we would consider applied arts, ancient um, steles or, 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 or arm armaments, etc. But one case is of particular interest. Buncho went to this beautiful temple uh, near Nara. I must admit I'd never been. It looks not so different today from how it would have been in his day. He went there because they had one particular painting of enormous interest. It showed Ono no Takamura, one of the great um, ancient historical sage poetic government ministers. Don't know who we would uh, make him similar to. Think of somebody from Greece and Rome, Cicero or some such person I don't know might be. A painting of him really showed what he looked like, they said. And painted by Kobodaishi, who was the greatest monk of the period. 
We would say it doesn't work because they didn't actually live at the same time. But um, they believe this anyway, a portrait of such importance, painted by a monk and therefore a person of deep understanding, showing a government minister who led, the go head, who led rule to virtuous virtue. And so Buncho arrives at the temple and asks to see it. The abbot is most unwilling to bring out this treasure, which is so hallowed, they keep it always in multiple boxes in a safe storeroom. But Buncho has a letter from the government saying it must be shown, so they bring it out to him. And Buncho says, I will copy it. The abbot breaks into a sweat. Nobody can ever copy this painting. It is so valued and cherished, it cannot even be seen by most people. We've done you a great favor in letting you see it. Well, Buncho shows the letter again, which says, I have author authorization to copy it. The abbot says, well, you better not, because if anyone tries to copy it, they will go blind and die. <laughs> and the abbot probably believed that. Buncho reposts, well, look how old and worn the painting already is. Leave it another two or three hundred years, and nobody will even be able to see it. We need to know what Onon the Bakumura looked like. We need to know how Kobo Daishi painted. A copy is the only way we can do that. And so he made his copy. He did not go blind and he did not go die, he not die. And having made his copy, this is the copy, he made a second copy and he said to the abbot, you keep the second copy and you can show it to everyone once you the painting. You don't have to see the old one. You can, the old one can be kept fetishized, if you like, locked away. So we have the notion then of the reproducibility of great works of art and a term that sometimes art historians use, the disenchantment of it. It's a move into modernity. The work of art is no longer important because it has a magical function. It's important because it's part of our heritage. Sadonobu collected these paintings in his uh, mansion in Edo, but he went one step further. All of them should be printed. That meant that anyone can have the complete works of Japanese art in a purchasable, of course, printed, therefore not colored, version. Sadly enough, he never was able to see through this. The printed edition was only produced in the Meiji period. But the notion that Japan has a culture very various. Over time, it's gone through all kinds of manifestations. There's not one thing. And yet, it is so exciting that it should be made available, and not just to the ruler who acquires it. It should be left in its place. It should be copied. It should be understood. And it should be then known about by all people. Matsudara Sadonobu or Tani Buncho working for him had no conception that this might even be the case, that people on the other side of the world would want to see these things too. And so we have here in Harvard, at the end of the earth, as far as they were concerned, the collection of Japanese art here too. Our modern notion of heritage is not related exclusively to nations. Sadonobu wanted his country to be preserved for his people. He, after all, was the chief minister of state. Today we would see human creativity and different forms of enlightenment diversely across the entire world. And we learn by copying from each other, by acquiring illustrations of each other's work, not by invading and taking it away, but by leaving it in place. Or if there are a superfluity of objects, as with Japanese painting the Edo period, we can share it around. There's enough for everyone. And so in the words at the time, they would have said, Miritaki, Miritaki. Blessings and bounty to everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Screech, for that for that wonderful, lively lecture. I did promise you inimitable, did I not? <laughs> and I think we certainly have seen that this evening. Thank you. And you've given us so many new angles from which to see. I can't thank you enough for being here tonight. To close our evening, um, actually, or to begin our evening, I should say, uh, 
Well, I would now like to invite you all to join us upstairs in the third floor galleries, the special exhibition galleries, which are open uh, until nine o'clock this evening. And we also have in the courtyard a reception. So please do join us there and enjoy. Thank you. <laughs>